We're continuing on with membranes here and so it's going to be our focus area for the next few classes. And we had spoken a bit about last on the class where we're aiming to go with this topic. Some of the things we'd like to understand is how long you can operate a unit for at constant pressure to achieve the desired separation. So we'll see um, we get build up of solids against our membrane. So we can only operate for a finite duration of time before we need to stop clean that membrane. And we'll see how that's done in space. We'll look at estimating mass transfer coefficients uh, through lab experiments. We will almost never use theoretical equations for estimating mass transfer coefficients. But we will start to see how that uh, is is possible, um, and I'll show you the equations for it, but we'll always resort, resort to experimental uh, conditions, just because what you'll find in practice is the mass transfer coefficients you do estimate are only fairly crude approximations. So we always use actual samples on real membranes to estimate our resistances. What pressure drops do we require to get a desired flux? And that's going to determine your pump size and making sure that the pump it uh, can operate on the pump curve where you need it. And then how much area do you need? So we said last time, if we consider this particular example, this is uh, in Cyprus, it's a desalination plant. Each one of these tubular units consists of um, consists of one module, but inside there there's a whole variety of membranes. These are hollow fiber membranes running the length of the tube. There's sometimes 3,000 odd tiny tubes running inside this one larger tube. And what we're doing is we're feeding on one side, on the inside of the tube is our, is our salt water feed. And then that's permeating up through the tube. The permeate is collected inside the shell. So each one of these thin tubes on the interior is uh, running the length of that tube. So permeate will leave throughout the external surface area. It's collected here in this particular diagram in two positions. Um, the retent tape that is the sum of the fluid that's retained inside the hollow fiber. So all that fluid that does not leave gets collected up at the end in a manifold there. These are the retent tapes. So inside each one of these is a far more complicated set of membranes. Okay. We also see that there's some spiral wound membranes. They take exactly the same geometry. A single tube, but inside there's a spiral wound uh, flat membrane that's just rolled up into, into a tube. So two, two potential alternatives over here. Just pointing out to you that this isn't just a single tube. There. There's, there's no more inside there. And also as a recap of the terminology we used last time. So permeate is the stream leaving through the membrane, so it's passed through the membrane. At a particular flow rate, we can then get that permeate, and then our retentate is the material retained on the, on the membrane side. So we saw that, uh, that in the last class. Now we're going to just take a look at the topic of microfiltration, and potentially we'll get, we will likely get to ultrafiltration today as well. So the term micro, ultra, and nano filtration refers to the pore size of, on, the, um, on the membrane. It's not referring to the size of the particles that you retain. It's only referring to the pores on the membrane. So here, microfiltration, these pores are in the order of uh, around 0.1 to 10 micron. So it's behaving exactly like the regular filter you had seen in the previous topic. Except this time we're replacing our filter paper or our filter cloth with the membrane. So no surprise in that the equations and the analysis for this section are identical to the previous week. And in fact, what we see is two types of microfiltration membranes, symmetric and asymmetric. So the, those are the two categories. Symmetric membranes are exactly what it says. It is there's a just one layer and it looks the same no matter where you're looking at it. So it's just as it's either here is like an open porous layer. So you see here these tiny holes. That's where the fluid will enter. Will enter this membrane, pass through these uh, pores that are, are irregularly shaped, and then leave on the other side as permeate. So my permeate is leaving them on the other side. You can also get more spongy type appearance membranes. 
So just depending on the polymers that you use and the method you, you create this membrane, you can create different <coughs> symmetric structures. And last class, uh, Leo asked, what's, what's the thickness of these membranes? Well, I said I didn't know. <laughs> the real class is right here in front of me. There it's there. So 10 microns is that length of that line. Here's 50 <coughs> microns is the length of that line. And I believe that's 2 microns. So that kind of gives you the idea of the thickness of those, those membranes over there. Now, let's just talk about the asymmetric membranes. Asymmetric membranes are structured in this particular way for, for a good reason. These symmetric membranes are taking the full force of that that uh, transmembrane pressure, the TMP, between 100 and 500 kPa, is being supported by that membrane hole. That membrane has to have the structural integrity to remain intact in such large pressure differences. So what was soon discovered is that, well, if we can create a membrane that's asymmetrical, where this spongy layer down here is actually the membrane that's receiving the fluid. So on this particular diagram, the fluid or the feed is coming in here on the bottom, and that's the membrane itself. This sort of finger-like area here is not filtering. That's not doing the filtration. That's simply a structural support with pore sizes much, much greater than the membrane itself. So this part over here is the actual filtration um, mechanism or the sieving is occurring along this layer. And then this structural support is just to provide mechanical strength for the membrane so we can operate at higher pressures. And the reason why those pores are much, much larger is, well, we, we don't need tiny pores there, right? We've already done the filtration down here, so we want that permeate that's passed through now to have as little resistance as possible to continue its path on. So large pores, they just can keep going. So the permeate will leave out here, and that's the flux we're going to measure on the end of the membrane. The feed will remain on this side. So asymmetrical membranes allow us to go to higher and higher pressure levels. And they they can be created either in a single go, or you can create them in um, what's called a composite membrane. So you can pull, combine two two membranes that have been separately casted and combine them up together to create that asymmetrical structure. Okay, so our, our focus in this course is not to look at the various ways of manufacturing these membranes. There's a variety of techniques, a variety of compounds, polymer compounds used, um, and that's that's a topic all on its own. It's it's, it's fairly, fairly comprehensive in detail. And it's well covered in, in, the, in the in the references I mentioned. So for those of you that have an interest in polymer chemistry, there's there's a wealth of reference material for you to go read if, if this is something that you're that you're kind of interested in. Key points here though, so membrane pressure drops uh, no, no more than 500 kPa in microfiltration. And the areas where we see these being used are in lots of cellular products. So cell, cell harvesting in bio applications, bacteria and virus removal, we we'll see that as well in ultrafiltration. Uh, so depending on the size of these bacteria and viruses we remove, we may need to go to a, a membrane that's got even smaller pores. And then um, air filtration is another area where this might be used. And it's widely, widely used in, in beverages. So almost always in the beverage manufacturing facility we'll find some sort of membrane step near the end to filter out and clarify. Okay, so let's take a look at a bit of the, the nomenclature and theory here. There's no need to derive this equation. It's up here because we've looked at it already in the filtration step. We have our volumetric flow, dv by dt over here. This is the, referring to the permeate. So j there, the flux, is the flow rate of the liquid leaving on the other side. So that flow, that's the volumetric flux of the liquid. We have the density of the fluid phase as well that we use. And in this term, altogether, the dv by dt times rho f times a, we call that our flux j. And because we have the density of the fluid term, uh, j actually has units of mass. So it's a mass flux leaving the memory. 
up to now, we've considered volumetric flux. We're now moving over to mass flux. So the, the mass flow per unit area passing through. So it's referring to that Permian stream. That's really what's of interest to us. Everything else is staying out on this side. So the solids and the feed are staying on this side. Only a certain amount of that permeates through, and that's the flux we're interested in. We can increase that flux J by ramping up our pressure difference. Okay, I'll define where we measure the pressure difference in a minute. And it's going to have two resistances. The membrane itself will be a resistance, and then the cake building up will also be a resistance in the same manner we had before. Now, there's a little bit of a difference here. I'll talk about it in a minute. But we, similar terminology, RM dash and RC dash, referring to the medium and the cake resistance, respectively. So let's take a look at the two mechanisms where, um, under which microfiltration is used. Either one can be used. What's called dead end flow is the regular filtration we've seen up to now. So you feed your, your feed through here, and the membrane is a dead end. There's nowhere else for the fluid to go. Um, to make this diagram more complete, there would be boundaries at the top and at the bottom here, preventing that fluid from going anywhere. So the only direction that the liquid phase can pass through is to the permeate. So it's just a regular filtration, like a plate and frame filter press. And all you've done is you've replaced your, your, um, your membrane. Uh, sorry, you've replaced your medium with the membrane. That's all the only difference here. No, nothing special. So that's dead end flow. We'll only use this for very low concentration feeds because, as you can imagine, this cake will quickly build up. Um, and it's very good for virus removal <coughs> applications. So because viruses are typically very small size, we can quickly build up the cake. And then the cake, recall, is what actually ends up doing the filtering and not the membrane. And that's, that's very applicable because, as, as I said, viruses are small. The pore sizes on these membranes are large, being 10 microns. That's a pretty large pore as far as sizes go. So viruses could go through that, that, um, that pore size opening. But once you've got your cake building up here, so you've got this sort of gel-like -like layer of all the cells building up, then that quickly becomes what's, what's causing the filtration. But, but more common than that, in especially where we want continuous operation, is what we call TFF, tangential flow filtration. So here we have a cross flow geometry, my feed coming in, and the particles on the, suspended in that feed will start to accumulate at the wall where we are allowing our permeate to pass through. So this wall up here, that's a solid, um, solid boundary. There's no, no permeate going through there. But down here, this is my membrane here in the dashed red. That's my membrane. And my permeate passing through there. My retentate stays on the membrane side, on the feed side of these. So what you'll find is that this flow coming in will, will shear away that cake that's building up. And that's desirable. So that cake then is being thinned out. And what it does is we have leaving here at the end is what's called a mobile slurry. So we should have leaving here, if, this, if there's anything happening in this membrane, what will end up happening is that liquid leaves are out here. So the concentration of solids coming in in my feed will be some given value. The concentration of those solids leaving out in the retent tank will be higher. So essentially all that TFF is doing is it's concentrating up your solids into uh, into a slurry that you can then send for downstream processing. So this is at a greater concentration. Leave it. And what we do is, when we're estimating our pressure drop here, now it's not so straightforward. Here our pressure drop is simply the pressure on the one side minus the other. That's, that's easy to calculate for dead end flow. But for cross flow we have a pressure of our feed, we have a pressure leaving. So there's going to be some pressure loss along this length, which can be, say, a meter or so, depending on, on the size of this membrane. So that's a pretty long uh, channel for this fluid to flow, and there's definitely going to be a pressure drop across there, and there's also going to be a pressure drop across the uh, membrane itself. So what we do is we take the average of the pressure in and out, so P in minus P out, 
average that up and subtract it from the permeate pressure. Okay, so that's, that's defined then as my delta P. That's why I've emphasized here a different color in red. So contrast that to the delta P we used for regular filtration, where we subtracted just what the pressure is simply across the membrane itself. <coughs> Okay, so just some, some other details to recognize is that with dead end flow, obviously our cake is going to increase with time, so that LC, that the thickness of the cake is going to build up for, as we've seen before, this resistance due to the cake gets higher and higher with time. Okay. As that increases with time, for a constant delta P and a constant medium resistance, constant viscosity, this is going up, my flux is going to fall off, and it falls off pretty dramatically. So, if we had plotted J as a function of time, what we'll find is for, for this dead end flow, we quickly drop, drop down as that cake builds up. So this is J as a function of time for dead end flow. What we'll find for cross flow filtration is we'll start off at some, some flux, and it will level off as well, but much, much slower. Because what's happening is we're shearing away those solids, eroding that cake, and preventing it from building up a, a large resistive layer over there. So we can, we can get higher fluxes with, with cross-flow filtration. And, the, and a key point here is that these two mechanisms are totally different from each other. So if you do an experiment with one setup, you cannot use the resistances that you compute from one and exchange it into the other. It's just so, so different geometry, even for the same membrane. Now let's... Uh, Let's take a look at how these are typically set up. So here's my membrane module over here. And my, my aim is to process a given amount of feed. So here's my feed point. I'm, I'm entering here, so I measure a pressure over there. My feed is, is here. And this symbol is standard in the membrane flow sheeting area. The stream leaving on the same side as the membrane, that's your retentate and then the stream leaving on the other side is your permeate. Okay, so our retentate gets fed to the storage vessel and that's where I'm pumping from. I may, may preheat it if necessary and send that into the membrane. So this retentate stream leaves, comes back to storage and gets cycled around. My permeate is what's leaving out here and that's uh, my fluid phase and that's that, that could be what I'm interested in in this particular example, is the permeate that I want to retain. Maybe the solids I'm not so interested in this particular separation. So a good example of this might be um, fine particles of sand or dirt in a liquid suspension. And we're not interested in those solids, but the liquid might be in, of interest to clean up and send to the next step where we're going to process it further. So, there's my pressure measured at the inlet, my pressure at the outlet. And that's what I use to calculate my average pressure in and out. And then I, I can also measure the pressure of the, re of the permeates and get, calculate my delta P. Now, what's going to happen here with time is that that membrane is going to start building up this, a cake layer. So we're going to eventually build up a layer of material on that. and one way we can deal with it is to wash away those solids periodically. So what we would say is we're going to operate in, in backwash mode. So what backwash does, and you'll see it over here, if we plot flux against time, backwash goes and we reverse the flow to clean away those solids. We blow out the solids away from the membrane surface. And the way we do that is quite simple. We introduce compressed air in over here. So open this valve, which is normally closed. Open that valve for compressed air. 
shut this guy, right? So you don't want to send your compressed air along this, this direction. You want your compressed air to come into the membrane and go back in the opposite direction. So close this valve. And then you can close over here as well. So you, you close your feed valve. So you're forcing that air to pass into the membrane and down here. Now you're going to pick up all these solids off the membrane surface and jet them back into the storage vessel. So every few minutes, you have the system automatically controlled so that these valves will open and close as appropriate, sending compressed air in to back flush your solids away from the membrane and move them into the storage vessel. Then open your valves up again and follow the regular path, path through. So what will the flow, the flux through the membrane then will follow the sawtooth pattern where you're, you're filtering for a while, the flux starts to drop off, you back flush and you go back to some higher flux because now you've cleaned your membrane out. Cake builds up again, back flush, <coughs> back to that flux and you keep, keep going over time. So if I did not back flush, so no back flushing, I could be at trajectories A or B. A is simply saying, this is the, the flux will drop off if I use a low velocity of inlet. So let's take a look where I'm referring to. I'm referring to the, this velocity coming in. If I choose to use a low feed rate coming in, I will then have low shearing and my, my flux will drop off. If I go to a higher velocity, then I will get back. But none of these will ever solve the problem of the accumulation of solids. So we periodically back flush. Um, what is the C as C goes in things? Does it keep going in zigzag forever? Uh, what, will, what is your expectation of that, that C curve for long, long periods of time? If you keep going down slowly, it'll start dropping and dropping and dropping until you can let flush all that thing in place and completely flush it. Okay, so what would be the reason for that slow decline? Because you can't get rid of all the scale or deposit on the surface of the material. Right, there's likely some amount of material that gets permanently stuck in the membrane or that gets stuck to a point where that compressed air cannot be able to remove it. So yeah, there, there likely will be a slow decline in that bit of time until you do a full clean. Okay, and so sometimes there's, they'll stop and do a, a chemical clean as well. So here we're just using air to, to resuspend the solids, but uh, sometimes you can do a, a chemical clean. Okay, so various mechanisms to improve that flux. We, that's obviously our, our goal here in many instances, to get that high permeate flux as possible. So when we're talking flux here, we're talking permeate. Increase your pressure, increase your uh, back flush rate. Um, you can choose different membranes. You can operate with low solids concentrations so that you uh, don't get such a large accumulation there. Um, operate at high velocities, <coughs> operate at increased temperatures. So increased temperatures will simply drop, drop down this viscosity term. Okay, so try to lower that. That's not a practical one in many cases, right? So it's expensive to, to, to lower that viscosity and it has less of an effect than, uh, say, changing pressure. So you can get more greater flux with putting in your utility costs for pressure differences than putting in energy to change viscosity. In many instances, not always. Okay. Sometimes we can pre-prepare pre our solids in such a way that that cake resistance uh, is altered, but again, these, these sort of suggestions are getting less and less practical as that list goes down. Okay, so here's some here's something for you to try out. This is exactly the sort of question you love to do. Yeah. Um, what's the main reason of keeping the feedback conditional? Is it to prevent uh, too much back washing? Keep the feed concentration low, just so that that solids concentration coming in is, is at a lower rate. So. Yeah, less of the time. So what you then you'll need to stage your unit. So you may need to have a sedimentation vessel up at the front to get most of the heavier solids out, and then take the overflow from sedimentation into a into a. Membrane. What's more typical, actual actually, than that example would be centrifuge first, then set, uh, then membrane next. So here's an easy one for you to to quickly work on. Question one and two are straightforward. We want to calculate what that membrane resistance is. So 
what is this Rn term? And we want to calculate then in question two, what is this resistance Rc? So give that one a go. You should be able to do this in about four or five minutes. If you finish them up, look at question three and four next. Let me see.
approach for number one? What is your plan to solve that particular question? So we can write on what we know, what we don't know, that's given up there, what we know, what we don't know is that membrane resistance. What is our plan to address or help with that? Okay, so you just propose to take a formula up on the board and set RC equal to zero. Is that a fair? Yes. So that's a pure, a pure feed of water. It's a pure feed of water. So we don't have a cake for that. We don't have any cake when we've got a pure solvent or pure feed of water. Then RC is zero because there's no cake at that time. So RC dash is zero for pure solvent. So I'll start using some terminology we'll be seeing next. So solvent is the liquid phase. So for pure feed of water, pure solvent, RC dash is zero. Salt for RM dash is then equal to delta P times J. And we have all those terms. We have the pressure delta P. So transmembrane pressure, 150,000, the viscosity of water is 0 0.001 pascal seconds, and J, the flux, is given there. So that's all in SI units. So it works out for us, and we get 2.5 times 10 to the 9. And what are the units there? So that's my membrane resistance or the medium resistance. Next step, question, yes? Sorry, um, in the notes, you have RM has units of meters the RM. So this is RM dash. Okay. So that's, that's a good point. Check the notes. Rm has units of meters per kilogram. Rm dash is units of length squared divided by mass. <coughs> okay, so for those of you that are are following through and recall the filtration notes, what units did we have for medium resistance in the filtration section? So to, let's do it. Rm in the filtration section. If you recall, Rm in the filtration section had units of 1 over mass. So what's going on here? section, our fluxes were measured in volumetric flows per unit area per unit time. So meters cubed per second per meter squared. In this section, our fluxes are measured as mass fluxes. So we've got that rho f out here in the front to then adjust for that difference. So if we go back there, rho f here is modifying our flux and creating a, a mass flux for us through that rho f. That means our units for the resistances change. Another way that you can see this, and this, this will help you for those of you that go in and 
work with the literature on membranes and filtration literature, there's a way to convert between those units that you should be aware of, and that is to note that Rn in the filtration literature is equal to Rn in the membrane literature. So if we're dealing with membranes, we're using this terminology Rn dash, you can get that by just dividing a filtration Rn by low F. So that's, that's the reason for this difference in the units. So just bear that in mind. Um, it's because of that fluid density. So that will modify the units and then everything is consistent. Yes. Uh, what's the main reason that for membranes we use a mass base Yeah, it's just, it's just more convention as, as far as I can tell. I haven't found a good reason for it. Absolutely, yeah. Any equation will work. And if you're working in an industry, you'll you'll settle on one one convention, right? Either you work with mass flux or with phases. Because that's more just a parenthetical point that it's not really related to that problem, but uh, just bear that in mind if you're comparing nodes across the sections here. So let's take a look at the next part. We're asking now to operate this, the same membrane at a higher pressure. So we're going from 150 kPa to 200, so higher pressure, but this time we've got the protein water mixture that we're feeding. So it's not pure solvent. We now have a solute of protein in there. And when we operate it at a higher pressure, I actually get a lower flux, 0.0216. So that's no surprise because now we have this protein building up against the membrane, so lower flux despite the higher pressure. What is that resistance term due to the cake? What's your approach to answering this particular question? Is it easier to use that formula and then use soft for RC and for RM you just use what we just calculated? Okay, so use the RM we've just computed and solve for RC. <coughs> um, the viscosity is always of like the liquid, right? The liquid follows of like what uh, the liquid is, right? Right. Exactly. Yeah. <coughs> okay, so in part two then we're solving for RC dash, and so starting from J is equal to the transmembrane pressure times or divided by the viscosity multiplied by RM dash plus RC dash, the membrane and the cake resistance. Rearrange that for RC and we get delta P we substitute in those values then MJ higher pressure this time same fluid viscosity different flux though 0.0216 kilograms per second per unit area minus then the computed value, so 2.5 times 10 to the 9. And that gets me an answer of 6.8 times 10 to the 9. Again, meter squared per kilogram. So the units of RC dash and RM dash are the same as you'd expect. <coughs> So part three then, we're asking, can we operate or estimate the pressure drop rather to achieve a flux of 0.035 kilograms per second? Okay. Straightforward application of that this equation, our, our base equation now, we, <coughs> we know Rm dash, we know Rc dash, we know our viscosity, we'd like to achieve this given flux. And you can show quite straightforwardly that that's 325 kPa. So we don't need to go through that calculation quite straightforward. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so simple use of this equation with the given R and RC to calculate the delta P. Next then, we're asking, well, if we're achieving a flux of 0, uh, 0 0.035, kilograms per second per meter squared. 
at a pressure drop of 325, can we achieve drops <coughs> of uh, roughly three times that? So I want to go from 0 0.03, I want to increase my throughput. Uh, this is standard. We've got a given membrane, can we get, can we operate it at a higher, at a higher rate? So my performance currently of the membrane is such that I'm getting this flight <coughs> point zero three five. Can I triple it? To point one. Yes. No, probably not, because the maximum PMP is about 550 for these kind of numbers. Okay, probably not because Brian's saying the maximum TMP is about 500 kPa. So, in other words, we're asking, does the scale linearly? Right, if I triple this, do I need to triple, if I want to triple the flux, do I need to triple my pressure? Yep, it's straightforward, right? So it's, it's a linear relationship here. This denominator, roughly constant. So the relationship is approximately linear. But what we're going to find then is it will quickly exceed that, that, that rule of thumb that the TMPs for these membranes for microfiltration are about 500 kPa. So you have to unfortunately go back to your boss and say, you know what, sorry, I can't get you this flux that you need. So your boss says, well, don't come to me with problems. I want a solution. <laughs> and that is? You should clean it more to reduce the RC. Clean it more to reduce the RC. That's one potential. You can use like a filter aid. Use a filter aid. What would a filter aid do? You can, it's something you can add to a slurry uh, that basically, uh, well, my understanding is it sort of separates Goes a little bit more so that it's easier to filter and then that the resistance due to the cake buildup is a lot less. Okay, so add this filter aid to perhaps decrease the resistance of the cake. Add a flocculant. Add a flocculant, similar idea to, oh, the, the pretreatment to drop out some of the solids yeah. so that you're feeding a lower solid concentration. <coughs> oh, and then like, oh, in, like on the way. On the way. On the way. So then what's going to happen to the solids? Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, lower cake resistance. Okay, so add a flocculant or a filter aid to reduce cake resistance. Any other options you can look at? With the max drop, that like pressure drop change if you had an asymmetric membrane? With the, yeah. uh, so consider a different membrane is, is what you're supposed to say. So go from your current membrane to an asymmetric membrane. So in this area, still the TMP for asymmetric membranes is still 500. Yeah. But it is a valid option if you were looking at increasing the flux in other conditions, for sure. Any other suggestions? You buy a second membrane? Buy a second membrane, get more area. Okay. So the nice advantage of membranes we saw in the introduction there was that they usually come in these modules. So you just buy another tube or another cassette and insert that in, split your feed up. So take your feed and now you're running membranes in parallel. Okay? So we're going to see this theme of parallel versus series. Take your feed, split it in parallel through to multiple membranes, collect up your permeates now at the, from both those membranes, recombine it and you'll get a high flux of total permeates. Okay? Why would you use series membranes? Higher purity. Higher purity. Okay. At what cost? <coughs> Lower productivity. Sorry? Lower productivity and you have more capital cost. Lower productivity, more capital cost. You have to pay now for the pressure drop over two membranes in series. Okay. So series versus parallel, there's a there's a need for series membranes if you need that higher purity, but it's going to come at greater capital and operating expense. Okay, so here's a Here's a final thought just to uh, end this topic off, and it's a very crude way to estimate the membrane resistance if you, um, if you want to, a very poor approximation. And it's going to always be too low as well. That's the other thing. So what we do here is we say, well, let me take a look at my membrane and consider it as the membrane. I'm going to just consider it as a series of pores. If I'm looking at it from the from the side view, so my fluid is coming in and passing through these pores of length L, C, or LM. So that's my length LM, is that the distance of the pores. And we know from 
the Hagen-Poisson law that the velocity through that pore of diameter d for a given pressure drop delta p and a given <coughs> fluid of viscosity mu and that, that length of the tube lm, we can use that theoretical derivation to compute the velocity in, the, in a single one of those pores. Now, if we take one meter squared of membrane and consider that that membrane has a porosity of epsilon, so let me just re-emphasize this point, what we're saying is if we take one meter cube, one meter cube, uh, one meter squared of membrane, and if I look at it from the top, each one of these openings is of diameter d, and if I had epsilon equal to 0.35 as an example, that's saying 35% of that area is porous or open and, and the remainder is membrane. So epsilon E is the fraction of the surface area from the top view. So now I'm taking a look at this guy. From the top, 35% of that is pore openings. What you can do is show that that velocity times the fluid density gets you the volumetric flux coming towards the membrane and then multiply it by epsilon to take into account the voidage and compute this theoretical term, delta P over mu, and collect all these terms in orange down here. So simple rearrangement of that equation over there, multiplied by rho F and epsilon, accumulate your terms into that orange bracket, and that's a poor approximation to Rm. Because you're just considering pure solvent coming through those tubes. It's a poor approximation because we know that at membrane, these tubes are not all length LM. These tubes are at different angles. They have different, different patterns like that. It's, a, it's a, not a direct path through the membrane. And also, the tubes are not all the same diameter D. So those are very, very strong assumptions <coughs> making down here. But we, the thing is, we do have this knowledge. We can look under a microscope and get an idea of the pore size. And we can measure with calipers Lm, and we can measure that epsilon. So those numbers are easy to obtain. And we can get a, a, a lower bound for Rm. So what we'll see in the literature is that this is a starting point, and then they modify this um, to take into account the reality and get better and better estimates of Rm. But what we will always do is simply do an experiment.